Hey, what is going on everybody and welcome to Fantasia for today. We're going to be jumping into another session of Epic 7 now today. Got some more update content for you guys. That's right, decided to actually follow through and give you guys this video even though it's a day late because you guys did... Uh, asked for my opinions on certain things, and I am actually quite excited, especially after the two new character previews we got. We also have a Lua balance adjustment to talk about, a couple new EEs, and a huge event that's going to be coming out, which is really nice. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the first major piece of news, which is the ML Lua update. That's right, she actually got a little bit of a balance um, adjustment for her, which is pretty cool. We'll talk about that, actually. Uh, her um, Natalon Academy kind of Moonlight Theater story is going to be continuing, which is kind of nice. There's also going to be some exclusive artwork that's going to be available if you finish uh, Season 1 Act 3. So, yeah, let's go ahead and tab over to the, uh, the Lua adjustment. Let's talk about that. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what they changed for Hellion Lua. Now, personally, I didn't pull for Lua. She wasn't really a unit that would kind of further my kind of play style or anything like that. Uh, and her gameplay, while it seems interesting, I just feel like she's such a niche pick and I don't have enough mystics to go for her. If I did, obviously, I would summon her just to have her. And she looks like a ton of fun. The issue is I just can't spare them at the moment. The mystics are quite precious. So, yeah, Looking into this here, though, we see a slight adjustment, but I think it's going to be a pretty noticeable one uh, in terms of how usable she's going to be. Now, instead of acquiring three souls, she now acquires two souls, not a huge uh, difference, honestly. Um, but yeah, the cooldown getting adjusted to decrease by an entire turn is huge. So Lua's challenge is her S3. This is the one that gives the challenge buff to all of her allies, increases defense for herself for two turns, and uh, decreases buff durations of everyone on the opponent's side by a turn before provoking them. Uh, so that's pretty nice, right? One turn cooldown means that she can actually turn cycle much faster, and if you use Hellion Lua with something like Laia or LRK, uh, you will be able to decrease her cooldowns even further, even faster, and turn cycle through and give everyone that buff yet again. Now, the challenge buff actually got changed as well. So now, instead of after counterattacking, where you'll deal 8% of the target's max health as damage, uh, you actually now deal to 10% now of the target's it's max health, so if four people attack, then that's 40% of that unit's health gone. Gonna obliterate the HP of tank units, but here's what happened. Uh, challenge now actually says that after using a basic skill, uh, when the target is a hero, you deal that ad you deal that additional damage, right? That's actually pretty interesting, okay? Because uh, the basic skill actually just gives you a bit more control when using her. So instead of having the opponent counterattack you now, you can just go on the offensive. If you're building a fast Lua, if you have a fast team, if you're playing offensively against tanky teams, uh, then yeah, after using your basic skill, it's it's probably going to be better than waiting for your opponent to hit you and then counterattack and all that stuff, right? So so I feel like this gives her a bit more flexibility in the types of teams that she can be used in. You can definitely use her in faster teams, and you can probably have some weird little combos going on, especially if you have uh, units with AoE hits for their S1. I'm still thinking about, you know, units like Bellion and such, but I'm sure there's more out there that uh, you can definitely use to your advantage. Again, she seems more like a fun unit. I still don't think this is going to be enough to really see her get, like, first picked or anything in the meta. Um, but hey, maybe time will tell, right? Maybe time will tell we're going to get some future units that come out that will deal some pretty insane damage with S1s. Who knows? Uh, but something to keep in mind. All right, so continuing on with the patch notes here, we have Ancient Inheritance Season 11 that's going to be coming out, and this is going to be exciting, right? Another guild event going on, which is really nice. It's kind of a pain to lead the guild during this time, making sure everybody's active. However, the rewards are typically worth it. This time around, the rewards are going to be Injury and Defense Sets. Now, we don't know the stats of any of these items just yet, but Defense Set is a fairly uncommon set that people um, 
probably want, you know, a couple pieces of lane around just to round out some builds. Uh, and then Injury is actually a set that's kind of seeing a little bit more of a rise in popularity. We're seeing a lot of people build Harseti, especially on Injury builds, uh, which can help with high HP uh, scalers and stuff like that, right? So it's kind of nice. It's kind of cool to see. We have to wait and see what the subsets are on these pieces, though. Um, they might not be perfect for Harseti, for example, but they might be good for something like Alencia, uh, who is going to see a bit of a little boost, maybe a little bit of a bump in her usage when uh, Young Senya comes out, or um, at least I'm hoping, or I'm coping, but I really like Alencia and I want to see her be useful. But we'll talk about Young Senya later. Uh, the boot, the helmet, and the ring are going to be um, accessible by fighting the bosses and by uh, beating the levels right in, in Ancient Inheritance, and then the rest of the gears you're going to be able to purchase with the uh, in-game currency. So anyway, moving on here, uh, Ancient Inheritance, we'll get into the nitty-gritty details once it actually releases. Um, Genoa is on raid up. I know a lot of people actually are looking forward to Genoa being on raid up. They're going to be summoning for him. Just keep in mind that we are going to have uh, a young Senya, limited Senya coming out. So if you don't have the bookmarks to spare, maybe kind of skip over the Genoa here. We're also nearing like the holiday season. So typically we might see another like limited unit or a wave of an event coming out, right? you're not entirely safe uh, in terms of your bookmarks. So do keep that in mind. Genoa is not a limited unit, and uh, hopefully maybe like in the near future we can get like a five-star selector or something where you can grab him if you really do want him. But his usage in RTA has kind of dwindled a little bit from when he was peak, right, back then when, uh, during his initial release, mostly thanks to uh, Imperian Ilanov, but also Emma Politis being a little less popular than she once was. People are opting to go for a lot of New Moon Lunas instead nowadays. Alright, anyway, next up we have two new exclusive equipments. This is huge, actually. Wukong and Fairy Tail Tenebria. So Fairy Tail Tenebria, another limited unit getting an EE. Very nice to see. She's going to get rerun as well. I'm pretty sure they're rerunning one of the uh, winter events or something very soon. Um, so we'll keep, in, keep an eye out for that. All right, but Fairy Tail Tenebra is exclusive equipment. I'm a little bit disappointed that its main stat is actually not speed. So yeah, well, well, it's it's effectiveness, right? Eight to sixteen percent effectiveness, not terrible. It does allow you to invest in gear that's more speedy. But again, ten speed EE here would have been absolutely amazing. Would have put her straight up there into the meta, I believe, in my opinion, at least. She has a really good, um, really good kit, but. Uh, she is actually kind of hindered by like kind of her skills and how they work. They're a little bit outdated, but let's go ahead and take a look here. One pair, right? This is her S1. It actually increases her chance to redirect provoke by 25%. So now she have a 100% chance to do so, which is not bad. If you're building her slower, bulkier, tankier, right? Kind of build her um, like about maybe 240, 250 speed as kind of a control unit. This might actually be a pretty decent little EE to use. Now, the next thing is Tea Party. That's going to be her S3. She'll grant a barrier to the ally with the highest max HP for two turns when using the skill, and then the barrier strength increases proportional to target's max health. So it could be something like 15% of the target's max health is going to be converted into a barrier. This is not bad because um, the main reason you're using Fairy Tail Tenebria is to redirect Provoke into your knights, right? Into your tank. Um, and whatever your tank is, is probably going to be eating a lot of damage. So the barrier is going to help soak up some of that damage. I think it's a pretty decent utility option for those who might seek it. It could be really funny on units like Yoha, because when her barrier gets damaged, she still reflects that damage onto the opponent. So it could be kind of cool. It could be funny to use, right? Uh, and then the uh, other EE here, the last one, is she'll dispel an additional buff when using her Tea Party. And this is tying back to what I said about her kit being a little bit outdated. Her S3 only really just strips a single buff, and that was the main issue with her, right? Um, the... The fact that her S3 didn't strip more than one was kind of detrimental to her kit and uh, and how it works. So if I pull up Fairy Tail Tenebra right here, you guys can actually kind of see. Uh, she normally only dispels one buff. So the issue with that is if you stacked, like let's say, uh, an immunity set, and then you had someone with a protection set on your team, so you get a barrier and immunity. When you use Fairy Tail Tenebria, she would actually only dispel the barrier. She wouldn't dispel immunity, which means you wouldn't be able to land this unbuffable or the redirected provoke. And like I mentioned in a lot of past videos, unable to be buffed right now is one of the strongest buffs that you can apply, or one of the strongest debuffs you can apply to the enemy team. So it is a very solid debuff. It's really good. She didn't get anything for S2. I think her S2 is pretty solid. It's pretty decent. Uh, but yeah, the S1 
if you mola this up, it's a 75% chance you could get it to 100%. I think it's probably going to be one of the least used ones. I think most people are just going to opt to go for the EE that uh, lets you strip two buffs instead, because it's going to make her kit a lot more modernized, and it's going to be a lot more effective, right? So anyway, moving back to the uh, to the EEs here, we have Wukong. So Wukong's EEs are pretty cool. So the first one here is going to be his S1. It's his swing attack, right? The one where he does an AoE. Now, swing will now attack all enemies even when counterattacking. This opens a whole new door for how Wukong can work. You don't have to build him on lifesteal sets anymore. You could just build him on a counter set. And that by itself is already really 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 cool and i hope they kind of do that for some other units that have similar things right i know they buffed kron before in the past where he it used to be when he counterattacked, he'd use his like basic attack animation but now when he counterattacks the fire kron he will use his um aoe animation as if he does it on his own turn right could be kind of cool could be kind of cool to see opens again opens the door for other units right i think it's a decent thing to have on wukong um, so, yeah, he also gets just free 12 crit rate, that's massive. Free 12 crit rate here for his EE, um, makes it so you essentially pretty much have to build almost no crit rate on him, if you, especially if you use his, um, own artifact, then you're gonna be getting another 18% crit chance minimum, right? So 18% plus this 30% crit chance minimum, you're really swimming in stats now, and that's pretty good. Uh, next up is the Immortal one, so this is S2. You can amplify his critical hit resistance and penetration resistance, uh, increased by his passive by 10%. Now, his base is already pretty good. Um, his base is already something like 70%, I believe. I'm going to pull him up here for you guys to see. So here's Wukong, and here he is in all of his glory. And his, um, his passive here, oh, sorry, it's 50%. Um, but then you can actually increase his critical hit resistance by using his, uh, his artifact here. So you can have 20% more critical hit resistance, which means if you get the, um, if you get this, uh, EE for his S2, you can actually go ahead and get 80% critical hit resistance, which is the highest of any unit out there right now. Even ML Landy, uh, ties Wukong currently without the EE for 70%. This would actually make him even more more resistant to crits, uh, which is nice. And then getting the penetration resistance increased to 60% is also massive. It'll make him super strong, actually, against a lot of defense penetration units. He already was, so into things like Dragon Bride, Senya, Blood Moon Haste and things, he was already pretty good. This'll, this'll make him even stronger, I think, and just more solid for Bruisery-type builds, especially on Lifesteal, so you can heal back your HP much more efficiently. Uh, but yeah, moving on here, his last one, his S3, you can increase the damage that's dealt by th uh, 20%. Uh, not bad, right? His S3 damage was already really good. I know some people are building, like, um, higher damage ones for Wukong, right? Higher damage builds for Wukong. I prefer tankier builds, so I think for me, it'll probably be the amplifying critical hit resistance and penetration resistance by 10%. It just fits my current build. I still like the lifesteal playstyle because you're bringing him into longer fights. You're fighting tankier units, these defense penetration, bulky soul weavers like Blood Moon Haste, bulky knights and stuff like LRK and like Dragon Bride Senya. So you'll have a pretty good time with him uh, in those situations, I'd say. His S1 is also really cool. I, I'm not personally really interested in building him on counter. I like Lifesteal a lot. It's one of my favorite sets. But if you build him on counter, that's going to be fantastic. Please let me know how that goes in the comments down below. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and continue here onwards with the patch notes. Um, yeah, so, oh, Powder of Knowledge is actually going to get updated as well. So a couple important things here. Uh, Bloodstone, very good PvE artifact to have. Again, if you don't have the powders, don't obviously don't buy these things because you want to get the limited artifacts when they do come out, right? They're much more important. But um, Bloodstone here is a pretty good PvE artifact. If you have the powders to spare, if you're swimming in like 800 powders or something, having a copy of Bloodstone is really useful. You only really ever need one, um, but usually units like Green Bologna uh, can use it really well for things like Rift, for uh, other PvE content you can use it in, right? like Nightmare Labyrinths and all that stuff. It's a pretty decent one to have on hand. Sigurd Scythe is the main one here. It is such a good warrior artifact, super strong on things like Fire Ravi, ML Bologna, 
right? Any unit like ML Ken, units that like hit really hard but also want to heal if they get low enough. Uh, Sigurd Scythe's fantastic. Rise of a Monarch is also, I wouldn't recommend buying this one, but just to keep in mind that it is one that's kind of on the rise in terms of use. People are putting it on Imperian Ilanov, Last Rider Crow, a lot of knights who are faster and can turn cycle quite quickly. Imperian Ilanov, especially because she gained so much combat readiness. It's actually pretty decent. It's pretty cool to see people using this. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that's all I really want to talk about with the powder shops here. Moving on, we have Rift Season 2 coming up. So um, yeah, they previously previously announced that the Rift Season 2 would end on the end of January. Uh, however, they kind of rescheduled it to the beginning of January, which is kind of nice. Um, but yeah, that, do keep that in mind if you're planning on holding off on Rift for whatever reason. Uh, do get to it as soon as possible. They actually do have an event going on right now as well. So if you are in Epic Set, and you're doing your rifts, you might have noticed that they have some otherworldly uh, rewards going on again. So the otherworldly chest has once again appeared. So if you ever go to your rift in Epic 7, you enter the rift and then you go here. It's currently going on right now. So until reset, you have, I have three days left and I haven't collected any, but you can find up to four otherworldly chests every week. So make sure you do your um, do your grind, right? Do your, do your rifts. You should have this running in the background uh, I'm going to go ahead and just start that up right now, and let's go ahead and just jump in. Okay, back to the patch notes. So, back to the patch notes here. Uh, let's see what we got. So, that was that. Other improvements are actually really, really minor. I do want to go ahead and talk about the young Senya and her skill set, along with the new Shuri and his skill set, though. So, we'll be right back. Okay, so before we actually talk about the new skill sets of these in new units, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this small clip from the Senya preview. Most of the preview is just like kind of lore and chatting and some fun stuff, but we see a new preview into the side story that's going to be happening, and I think this is actually really cool. Um, I would love to see more of these types of things being integrated into the game, and Smallgate has actually been really good with exploring other avenues of gameplay, right? Um, this is kind of taking in like Ancient Inheritance a little bit, but with more of a kind of, um, you, know, you know, a more creative um, kind of approach to it. Because Ancient Inheritance is kind of, you know, kind of stale with like it being, you know, the same thing every cycle. You know, different maps, but the same bosses and the same fights, which is good. Consistency for those types of contents are good. But for this here, um, yeah, kind of tying it to other side story events that we've had in the past, I think it's going to be kind of worth exploring for Smilegate to, to continue experimenting with these types of things. Really looking forward to it. That looks really well put together, honestly, and hopefully the gameplay loop is going to be fun too. All right, now off to the skill sets. Okay, so let's start off with Young Senya's video preview. Her animations are absolutely amazing, just Alencia popping out. I also love the people who on Reddit who like edited uh, Mort's face um, instead of Alencia's there. It is absolutely hilarious, but also really sad at the same time. <laughs> Those of you who know, know. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Senya here. So her kit is going to be pretty interesting. Uh, people are saying she's a really cool Harseti counter, but let's take a look at her stats first. She has pretty low speed, 102, not very good. For reference, like DDR has about like 100 speed or something like that. He's really slow, right? So Senya probably not going to be built super, super fast, although you might want a bit of speed on her, right? She doesn't awaken too much into effect resistance, not like Schneel who starts off with like 30% effect resistance, but she actually does have quite a bit of health and defense, kind of like her um, her other versions of herself, right? She is a pretty tanky unit overall, but that's not bad. And you, if you have imprints for her, you can imprint into effect resistance, so that's pretty good too. Uh, her skill too here is no bullying oh man guys get that like no bully meme going on right i love that um maybe that'll be a thumbnail in the future at the start of the first battle though she gains 30 fighting spirit keep in mind this means that ml politis automatically good against her uh and when the foremost ally except for the caster is an earth elemental hero gains 40 additional fighting spirit before granting special friendship to the target when attacked, gains 20 Fighting Spirit, and when Fighting Spirit is full, consumes all to dispel all debuffs from the caster before activating help. Help. 
attacks all enemies and grants an extra turn to the caster. A successful attack deals additional damage equivalent to 15% of max health of the caster and the foremost ally except for the caster. Now I do have to actually preface this with uh, they've changed this. They've changed this little modifier here. Um, it is a lot of damage that this would give. So I believe they actually nerfed it a little bit, uh, but this is prior to release, so I, I guess it's fine. They're just kind of finding a, striking a balance, right? Before we have access to the characters. Popping in here with a little bit of an interruption, I apologize for that, but uh, this is where the confirmation was. It's under the Young Senya preview on the Stove website. So it says the amount of damage dealt by Young Senya's help skill has been changed after the preview recording. We appreciate your understanding and uh, patience regarding this change. So we don't really, I don't think, have any details on what the change is going to be. I'm pretty sure they're going to reduce it, but by how much, we don't really know yet. Uh, but yeah. Gonna look forward to seeing what the final result is gonna be, but the, what they currently gave us in this preview was absolutely insane. All right, so back to the preview here, right? The main thing that I, I'm taking away from this is this. At the start, you gain 30%, right? You have 30% fighting spirit, and if the person in the front is Earth, you gain 40 more. You start with uh, 70, 70 fighting spirit. Okay, that's actually not bad. Uh, you'd actually be 80 because you'd, you'd have to add in her skill enhancements here. So you start with 40, you gain 40 if the front un line unit is Earth. And then if you get hit, you uh, get to consume all of your fighting spirit to spell all debuffs from herself. And then you would also go ahead and deal a ton of damage to, to the enemies, right? It's an AoE hit and it grants an extra turn to yourself. So you take the turn afterwards. It's pretty decent, it's pretty good. Um, the, the main thing here is that the additional damage still relies on a successful attack. So if you're against evasion units, like for example, Fire Flan, who will always evade your earth units, uh, especially, you know, Senya, Valencia, those types of units, Mort, for example, that you're going to be using with her. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's going to be um, quite interesting to see what the matchups are going to be like for the drafts. The other thing is that you're very restricted to the foremost ally, the frontline unit, being an Earth Elemental Hero, right? Uh, you do want the person in the front to have crits. So Special Friendship, that buff over here, says after attacking on the bearer's turn, a critical hit deals additional damage proportional to the bearer's max health to the target. So to take full advantage of her kit, you do want someone who can deal damage and do crits. Things like Alencia, things like Mort. So if you're thinking about using her with like, oh, I can tank down with something like a Yoha, or maybe um, even the um, normal Senya, Earth Senya, right? Not the young Senya. Um, she doesn't have synergy with them because they're not built on crit builds usually. Um, and yeah, so you do have to think about who you're pairing her up with. It might be a little bit restrictive for right now, but hey, keep in mind that Wukong got buffed and you can use him as well. And now he can be built on counter too, so. It's pretty interesting. The other thing to note is that people are calling her a Harseti counter. Because she starts with 80 fighting spirit, uh, when she's attacked, she'll gain 20. Both Harseti's S1 and her S3 uh, are AoE hits. They have at least an AoE hit in them, right? S1 has a hit and then an AoE follow-up. So even if they're not targeting young uh, Senya directly, that AoE follow-up would hit Senya, cause her to gain 100 fighting spirit. She would consume everything, dispel all debuffs from herself, and then activate help, which will deal a ton of damage. Right, that's actually pretty cool. Battle. And gaining that fr uh, special friendship spirit. buff is actually pretty nice as well for dealing that extra um, damage proportional to max health. Uh, it's basically like having the 3F artifact. It's kind of insane. Even though the showcase here, it shows her, you know, getting the cleanse here after Harseti attacks. The which is very nice, and, the and then boom, right, extra the damage. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind here is that the, um, notice that the special friendship buff, right, here, I'll rewind here a little bit, so you can see that Harseti actually puts an unbuffable onto the, um, onto the Lencia, but that special friendship buff, it's still there, it starts the match with it, right, so it's not like, oh, Harseti puts unbuffable, I can't get the special friendship, no, 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 you just have that buff, it's actually quite insane, um, but yeah, this is, um, after attack on the, the um, person who has the buff's turn, a critical hit deals additional damage. It's pretty cool. Now, let's uh, continue here with the preview, because you do pick up a lot of information from watching the preview here. For example, Alencia attacks, look at that damage, boom, extra damage proc. But look at that. Did you see it? That's right. Special friendship. Your friendship bond doesn't just last a single turn, it stays. And that is incredibly important, because now you essentially just gave the frontline unit 
if they if they crit, that is, you gave the frontline unit a uh, 3F. Um, 3F for someone that already crits and already does a lot of damage is quite nutty. So yeah, this might uh, cause people to rethink their Mort builds or Alencia builds to try to pair up with the young Senya. But again, if you're kind of just going for a Mort or an Alencia as her partner, you have to keep in mind, you have to utilize ban protections quite well in order to get away with that, because people could just ban your Earth unit that you are trying to pair up with her, and then suddenly you're not really countering Harseti as well as you thought you would, right? So do keep that in mind. All right, next up, we have skill three, snack time. So uh, she actually stops fighting and takes a break. She dispels all debuffs from all allies and then grants continuous healing for two turns before increasing combat readiness by up to 20%. Not bad. She also acquires 20 Fighting Spirit this way, too. So if you build her faster, and you just start the match, you have 80 Fighting Spirit, because there's an Earth unit in the front line, you can just use this, and then uh, use your S3, you cleanse everybody, and then she'll do her extra attack, all that stuff, and then she, remember, that extra attack, when she gains the 100% Fighting Spirit, gives her an additional turn, too. So that's insane, right? She's going to be taking a lot of turns. But um, the continuous healing and the, and the cleanse are going to be very helpful. So after she, you know, after her Marcetti attacks, you know, your units have the no, unable to be countered, uh, unable to buff, and she can just cleanse that right off the team through her eating snacks, of course. Uh, but yeah, the healing buff's also really good. Continuous healing is a pretty decent buff. Unfortunately, it does require you to take a turn. It can get stripped. It's not as good as just outright healing, but, you know, it can last for up to two turns, so if your opponent can't strip it, then you do have uh, kind of an advantage in terms of healing, right? Just over the course of the match, uh, it is pretty decent. Uh, her S1 is going to be Oopsie, where she spills bread to attack the enemy, and she triggers a dual attack from a random ally and increases combat readiness of the caster by up to 15%. This is insane. Uh, the combat readiness will also increase to all allies if you use 10 soul to soul burn. So, kind of like what, um, you know, Ocean Breeze Luluka kind of does in pushing up the team. Think of Mediator Cowork and pushing up the team, right? But now, instead of just, uh, well, you have that effect in, like, Soulburn, right? You gotta push up everybody. It's kind of like Ahmed Soulburn, too. You push up everybody with her S1. The main thing here, though, is the dual attacks. Uh, it's random dual attacks, so think about things like Laia, think about C. Lilius, right? You're going to be dual attacking. It's unfortunately or fortunately going to be random. You're not going to be dual attacked with the highest attack ally. Otherwise, I mean, come on, guys. Um, <laughs> Navy Captain Landy, more abuse with Navy Captain Landy, because that's what I see if it's the highest attack. Uh, ally here. But yeah, oopsie is a pretty good move. Again, especially because if you start, let's say you start the match, your opponent doesn't have a Harseti or anything, you start with 80 Fighting Spirit, your opponent debuffs you, right? Let's say you use New Moon Luna or something, a non-tech skill, they debuff your team, great. Then you use an S3, right? You cleanse everybody's uh, debuffs, you gain that 20% uh, Fighting Spirit, 20% Fighting Spirit, and then you get to pop your S2. Your S2 gives you an extra turn, boom, you take an extra turn, now you can S1. So actually not a bad combination of skills that you can use here. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how it plays out, right? How, how people are going to utilize this. Uh, this kid of hers. Now, I think she's going to be really good and very important to pull for. I would highly recommend you pull for her. There's no question about it. Uh, she's a very solid unit, even though she's a bit restrictive. Again, a bit restrictive. I don't like element restrictions, but at least she's not restricting you to a mono-element team, right? She's not like, oh, if all of your allies are Earth allies. So she kind of um, reminds me a little bit of... Uh, what is her face? <laughs> the the ice mage thinking about the ice mage here so let, let me gonna pull her up she also requires um you to have like a fire and an earth unit on your team fumir right was her name fumir was her name yes indeed so let me go ahead and just show you guys fumir here where she actually has something very similar so she has elemental wisdom and elemental wisdom uh can stack up to three times you grant a stack when an ally other than herself um, takes a turn, right? So it's once per element as well. She is ice, so you need a fire and earth at the start of the fire earth elemental turn, and at the start of the caster turn, you gain an elemental wisdom to the caster. So she is someone that relies on other units uh, and other elements. So yeah, keep that in mind that Fumir works. She is one of the scariest units to fight against in a cleave. If you fight against Fumir with DDR, it's absolutely incredibly annoying because she has a two-turn sleep. 
Uh, but I think Alencia will have a similar form of impact. It's kind of a little bit trickier to pull off, but you get a pretty decent reward from it. All right, anyway, back to the uh, the actual um, kit here. So we see uh, she has an artifact. It's a pretty cool artifact. Proof of friendships, not proof of valor, but proof of friendship. Uh, and this is pretty decent too. So it increases the health of the caster and the foremost ally except for the caster by up to 10%. If you only have a plus 15 one, you'll get halfway through. So you'll get 7.5%. Uh, of the max health, that's actually nothing to laugh at because Prayer of Solitude has a similar type of effect. Uh, these types of effects in the artifact apply after your stat buffs and, uh, apply to your units. So kind of like Prayer of Solitude, it will just exponentially increase the amount of HP that you would have. It's pretty nice. Now, at the end of the turn, you also have a up to 100% chance to increase combat readiness of the foremost allies um, by 15%. Percent. That's if you max limit break it. Even if you don't max limit break it, I think the increase in HP is already a pretty decent uh, use of the artifact, right? It gives you something that applies at all times, and this is like a little bonus effect that you would have. So at the end of the turn, you'd push up the uh, combat readiness of like a Lensier or Mort, whoever's in the front line, uh, and so they can turn cycle. It's not bad. You can also actually use this on other Soul Weavers too. So people have been theory crafting. You can use something like Ahmed, for example, with Proof of Friendship. So when she has twos and she has threes, right? Uh, yeah, so you're going to be pushing up that, that unit by a ton. It's at the end of the turn, so it's once per turn. It's not just once per match. So Ahmed has twos, takes an extra turn, right? Pushes up the ally by 15%. She has three, she pushes up that ally again. Right? Her S2 pushes, her S3 pushes, but then this artifact is also pushing. So you can have a base speed unit that you can possibly cleave with Ahmed. That's actually quite insane. But again, to have it work 100% of the time, you would need to max limit break it. But again, I don't think you really need it maximum broken uh, if you are just like kind of playing with a more bruisery team. Uh, the consistency is nice though, keep that in mind. If you can, do it. You know, bottles of knowledge, they're not too expensive. You can just kind of uh, gather them over time. But I think there are some other artifacts that are worth enhancing over this one, up to plus 30. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that is going to pretty much do it for Alencia's kit here. We've already kind of seen the uh, the damage that was applied. But just, just one more time, I want to show you guys the amount of damage that's done by her S2 here. So the reason why they kind of decrease the amount that is done, just look at that. That's insane amounts of damage. Right, absolutely insane amounts of damage that comes out. If she is going up against squishy units and stuff, because this scales with their max health, right? Not with the opponent's max health, it scales with your max health. Uh, then yeah, it's, it's going to be incredibly scary. This Alencia in the preview, by the way, has 34 thousand hp that's ridiculous absolutely insane and this senya also had like 30k health it's kind of nutty guys uh i don't know i don't know what to say about it besides uh yeah watch out because alencia is coming <laughs> alencia is coming for you Okay, so now for a change of pace, right? You had all this lovey-dovey, very cool, light-hearted Alencia and Young Senya stuff, and now we have this Executioner Shuri that's gonna be popping up with his kit. Again, in the future, I'm gonna be talking about these units, perhaps in their own videos, but uh, yeah, today, because we're short on time, we're already a day late to the news, uh, we're just gonna talk about everything together. Um, so it keeps everything in one place, so that's kind of nice. But yeah, Shuri here, his S3 animation looks absolutely amazing. He's apparently in the storyline with Last Piece Corinne and MLK Ron, which is really cool. And so we're gonna check out his uh, his stats. The main thing about his stats are not actually his stats themselves. Uh, he's a four-star Dark Elemental Ranger, and he has decent speed. 111 is not the best, but it's not terrible, right? Um, he's kind of a follow-up unit that you would use, and he has um, effectiveness imprints as well, so that's pretty cool, right? Self-imprint for effectiveness, and he awakens in effectiveness, but you're gonna notice here for his uh, imprint, his team imprint is 10 speed. Just like a Fire Shuri and just like Watcher Shuri, um, Executioner Shuri here is gonna be absolutely insane. Gonna be used for sure in Cleave teams and... Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to be very happy about that. However, I am looking forward to him because he synergizes with burn units. So let's talk about his skills. His S2 is called Operational Readiness. It increases his effectiveness by up to 30%. And when attacking, he cannot trigger a critical hit.
so less stats to invest in. At the start of the battle, he grants explosives to the ally in the back row except for the caster. So you can't put him in the back and also get the buff on yourself. That's what it's saying. But explosive says after attacking, plants a bomb on the target for two turns. It's dispelled after attacking. So it's kind of a one it's like a one turn like gimmick that he has going on. You give the explosives to a person in the back line. Hopefully they're an AoE unit. So when they attack with an AoE skill, they're going to plant bombs and then watch. And then uh, I keep wanting to say watch a Shuri. Executioner Shuri is going to come in and deal massive, massive amounts of damage. So they show an example here with Silver Blade Armintha. She bombs, she stuns, right? And that's already a lot of burns that are being applied by the Araminta. Now we go in for the skill three, Merciless Execution. That's right, in cold blood. He's just going to destroy the entire building. So he attacks all enemies. It's an AoE. And then he has a 100% chance each to inflict two burns uh, for two turns. And then at the end of the turn, he detonates burn effects and bombs inflicted on the target. Hey guys, you uh, you wish you had that Power Captain Flan buff by now? She's been so relevant in the meta, right? Ever since we overturned that buff as a community. Good job. But uh, yeah, look at this. Just again, kind of a better Pirate Captain Flan obviously achieves a different purpose. This is just going to annihilate the enemy. Why control your enemy when you can just absolutely blow them to smithereens, right? Uh, two extra burn effects with a burn detonation and bomb detonation, right? So you want whoever's going before him to inflict that bomb. And then now you can inflict the burns and then detonate that bomb as well. So he might ha actually have uh, synergy with Pirate Captain Flan if she was buffed. But yeah, look at that. Look at that damage. It's just insane. 32k health right here, right? 34k health. Like what is going 33k health and 12k health in the back line. Just look, they're just decimated. ML Sandy doesn't even trigger because that damage was all like detonation damage. It wasn't even you physically attacking the unit, bringing them below half health. I don't even know what units that they were fighting. It doesn't matter because you're not surviving 30k damage, right? Um, yeah, I don't even see, I can't even see what they were there. <laughs> Oh my god, it's so satisfying. Now, that was obviously a best case scenario. You had Silverblade Armintha's uh, bombs, and or sorry, Silverblade Armintha, obviously you're going to plant the bomb, but she gave a couple burns as well, so that's probably helping his damage quite a bit. It's doubling his burn damage that he has to detonate from. Uh, but yeah, Silverblade Armintha did get a buff, so keep that in mind. Fire Armintha also can work quite well with him. Uh, she is a pr pretty popular kind of like a... I wouldn't say anti-meta pick, but she's a good pocket pick for some players and how they fight, especially into units like a Tywin. You can overwhelm him with debuffs. Kind of cool. Uh, and then you can also just utilize him with any other unit that just strips buffs at the start of the match, right? Anyone that does an AoE buff strip that attacks the enemy. For example, like a, um, like a, uh, what was her face? Um, Knockwall. That's what I want. I was going to say Lua, but no. Knockwall, right? Knockwall, for example, does an AoE. You reset your opponent for a turn. You put the bomb on them. Oh boy, right? They're kind of screwed. And then you can come in with the Execution Shuri and then detonate and do a ton of damage. You can also use them with other fun units like Fire or Carrot, for example. So uh, Carrot is a unit that I'm definitely looking forward to testing out with him uh, because she's one of my favorite characters in the entire game. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that quite a bit. Will she be viable in RTA? Probably not, but hey, I can try try. All right, anyway, his skill one is overpower. It attacks the enemy and has an 85% chance to burn for one turn, and when the skill three is unavailable due to cooldown count, uh, activates annihilate instead. So you would attack the enemy, uh, attack the enemy burning for one turn, and then you detonate the burn effects at the end of the turn. So again, kind of like a fire carrot, right? Just kind of detonating burns, uh, kind of like, um, yeah, most, most burn units now just detonate burns, right? Most most of them nowadays, if you inflict bombs, you detonate them yourself, right? Even like Veronica does that, and she's a four star. So she inflicts bombs with her S3, she goes, takes an S1, she detonates the bomb. Uh, Shuri here is just going to do more burn damage. The issue with cleaving with something like Shuri, though, is Over that... Um, the oh, and his soul burn, sorry, before I get to that. His soul burn uses 10 souls. You inflict an additional burn effect for one turn, which is huge, by the way. If you activate Annihilate, if you've already used your S3 and you're using his Annihilate here, you'd get two burns and you detonate them. That's a lot of damage. It's actually not a laughing matter, right? That's a lot of damage. That's soul burn effect. The only thing is, and I was just about to say this, uh, is that you can get resisted 
So using Shuri is a gamble, quite literally a gamble. Your opponents can build high effect resistance, obviously, but he has nothing that ignores resist, right? Nothing of nothing nothing in this kit uh, ignores resistance. Even a soul burn doesn't ignore resistance. So you're really banking on the fact that you can land these burns. If you can't land these burns, look at that. Three burns did 9,500 damage. So a burn, 3,000 damage, right? Uh, that was with an attack buff, by the way. So it's not going to be a whole ton, especially if you want to build him with a little bit of bulk to keep him alive. If you're cleaving, obviously, then you're not going to need bulk. But if you're playing a little bit slower, if you're just having fun like me, maybe you need some in bulk. You need some effectiveness for sure to be able to land the bombs, especially because nowadays you don't really know. People are on either extreme of like, you know, under 100 resistance or everything's like 200 plus resistance, right? So do you, have to, you do have to keep that in mind. Uh, Shuri... I think it's going to be cool. Is he going to replace like ML Ludwig as like the king of cleave? No. No. ML Ludwig is still just a way better investment, but one thing you can do with Shuri that you can't do with Ludwig is fight without soul burns. So, uh, yeah, you don't need any souls here. Look, this this guy's actually, uh, the demonstration here is actually showing what happens if you don't bring any souls. They actually have Frida, I think, on the her uh, soul artifact or something. Spotted, yeah, spotted mouse hair tie to show the um, the soul burn with uh, Shuri himself. But yeah, getting the attack buff here actually does help the damage quite a bit. So without an attack buff, it's quite important to note that you might not actually just kill everybody here, right? You might not actually kill everybody. So Blade Armintha, uh, yeah, so missing. But again, notice how even though she misses, because it's an effect from a buff, the Flan actually gets the, uh, the bombs on her as well. So Evasion can't really dodge that bomb effect. And then he still detonates it, still does a ton of damage there. 12k damage from that one bomb detonation is actually not bad. But keep in mind, that's with an attack buff on him. But yeah, anyway, that is it for uh, Shuri here. And that's pretty much it for the overall patch preview. Let me know what you guys think of everything that we've covered in the comments down below. Love to hear your thoughts, and I'll catch you all next time. Take care.